Welcome to Joy of the Eucharist, Summer Retreat. Beginning with the Feast of Corpus Christi, our parish will be entering into a year of Eucharistic love. Without love, or at least a desire to love, the Eucharist is simply a host and Jesus is simply an idea. But we want our hearts to burn with love and desire for God and the Holy Eucharist. So with this hope, we will be going on retreat together this summer with I Believe in Love, a book written by Father Jean-C.J. Delbay based on the teachings of St. Therese of Lisieux that will help you to focus on him throughout each day, rest in him amid your troubles, and live joyfully with him at every moment. This book has impacted both of our lives profoundly, and we're so glad that you're with us and hope that this retreat will bring us all deeper into the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. Our second conference, entitled Humble Confidence. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving God, we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit and confident love of you. In humility and trust, may you be all and in all for us. May our trust and confidence in you know no bounds. Remind us of your goodness, and through this time spent together meditating upon your love for us, May we come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of how far, the lengths, the depths you will go so that we can confidently put all of our hope in you. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, pray pray for for us. us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Conference 2, Humble Confidence. What a, a beautiful chapter. What did you think? I love this chapter. It's one of my most favorites. It's like everything that you need for your, your sainthood right here. Boom. Simple, Boom. easy, humble confidence. And it's straight from St. Therese. St. Therese like mastermind and came up with this whole idea. Um, last chapter we talked about her elevator, yes. right? This is the humble, confident elevator. Just recognizing our littleness, recognizing our need, how incredible it is, how simple it is. And that... God's just going to come down and pick us up. like, mm-hmm. And that's the hardest part, is to have that confidence that he is going to do it. Mm-hmm. But we, we'll get into that later. <laughs> Father, will you talk about the meaning of the word confidence? Let's just start with confidence. If we're going to talk about humble confidence, we know a little bit about humility, but let's talk confidence. So Webster's Dictionary defines confidence as... The feeling (laughs) or belief that one can rely on someone or something. Firm trust. The state of feeling certain about the trust of something. You're really going to do this like this the whole time. This is like really (laughs) distracting. (laughs) That's uh, the Webster's definition. Well, that's not a good definition for us. I like it. You don't like it? It's okay. Okay. So the feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something. Firm trust. The state of feeling certain about the truth of something. Conviction. Certitude. Mm -hmm. You don't like that? That's great. Let's break it down. Confidere. Faith with something. Faith in something. So confidence, true confidence, has an object, right? We have confidence in something. And so when we speak uh, of the meaning of confidence, what can we put our faith in? Who can we put our faith in that's the most sure, that's the most reliable? We can have confidence that the chair that I'm sitting in isn't going to break, but sometimes after a big meal, <laughs> you never know. Uh, right? We... Quick, super quick story that happened to my cousin at Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst time, yeah, too. she's sitting right across yeah. from me and John. Oh, he could not stop laughing. I mean, right on our butt. It was <laughs> oh, so funny. Thing. Great. Yeah, so moment. so you could have confidence in that she situation. Had so much confidence in that and chair. And and it didn't, didn't, it didn't hold her up. Mm-mm. So you could have confidence in, in people or in things, but ultimately what you put your faith in, what is the object of your confidence? Who's going to never let you down? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. All right. Give me Jesus. So that confidence that it comes from putting all of your hope and your faith and your trust in him means that as, as uh, the author says, it summarizes all the theological virtues. Faith, hope, and charity. Confidence includes faith because you ha- uh, the object of faith um, is God. It includes hope because if God loves us and desires good for us, then we should expect that goodness in our life. And it includes charity because we have to love. Love is the, the source of our confidence 
And it is the strength of our confidence. In as much as we love, is as much as we're able to be confident, in as much as we recognize that we're loved and that God is good to us, is how much we can can trust in him. And so in you know I'm gonna have to go back in ten seconds that. That's a lot. Like it's so simple, but it's like just a lot. I've never thought of confidence having anything to do with those virtues. Hmm. And I feel like like for myself. Because mm-hmm. I'm slower than you. <laughs> like, uh, just taking this to prayer and really going into it and breaking it down, it's really beautiful. Yeah. And those three virtues are the center of our faith. Faith, hope, and love. And we know love is the only one that will remain. Um, and so, yeah, confidence in a, in a sense speaks to each one of those in a particular way. So I've been working on this confidence thing since last time I read this book or the first time I read this book, which was like about five years ago or so. Um, But at the same time, while I was trying to do better with this confidence in God thing, um, and this is like just a very, very super recent epiphany that I've had, um, I totally just pushed hope aside. Mm. Like even when I was praying my rosary, you know, the the first three beads or Mm -hmm. like Hail Mary for... Faith, hope, and love. Yes. Yeah, faith, hope, and charity. Yeah. Uh, so I always, you know, are you supposed to do hope first? No. Is there, is there a faith, like, is hope, there a, love. you're it's supposed typical. to faith? That's the typical. So I do order. it first. You do. <laughs> so this is not like. <laughs> Disclaimer, warning. Yes. <laughs> what you should do. But what I do <laughs> is I would always put hope first uh-huh. because it's the thing that I re- wanted the least. Hmm. Yes, because it's like, okay, so I hope that's great. I'm going to put that first, get it out of the way. But really, I would need an increase of faith. Yes, I really need an increase of faith uh, because obviously if I don't have faith in God, then what do I have? Sure. And then put charity or love last because that's what I need the most. I'm so bad at loving people the way that I'm supposed to love people awful Hmm. and so I put that one last because I needed it the most and somehow maybe because I wasn't doing the rosary (laughs) the way that I was supposed to or something I don't know maybe I opened the door for something but um I just didn't have a like hope wasn't at the forefront of my desires and realization that I really really need hope to be with God. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I was starting to have this realization ago, it was just about a month and a half ago, I hit despair harder than I had in a really long time. And mm. I realized it was because I had been rejecting the necessity of hope, which is so ridiculous. And I subscribe to, I think it's the Catholic companies, like morning offering email that they send you every morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the quote Oh, I don't think it was the quote of the day. It was like an excerpt of a book that they're like trying to sell, but it's really good because then that's how you get to know a lot of books. Sorry, I digress. <laughs> okay, going back to my point. Um, when I realized this whole thing about my lack of hope, what was in that morning offering email was St. John of the Cross. And uh, it says... St. Paul calls hope the helmet of salvation. Now a helmet is armor, which protects and covers the whole head and has no opening except in one place where the eyes may look through. Hope is such a helmet for it covers all the senses of the head from the world in such a way that they cannot be lost in worldly things and leaves no part of them exposed to the arrows of the world. So no wonder I was hit so hard by despair. I didn't have my helmet on Mm. and I felt Mm -hmm. like I didn't even need it. So I just... That's why I wanted to like put a little asterisk on yeah. this part of this chapter because hope is so important. Confidence and hope and how they go hand in hand. Yeah. And our world is so full of despair and sadness. And when we look around, there are we don't see as many reasons to hope. Yep. So working intentionally on that theological virtue of hope, I think, is, is something necessary that we all have to do. Yeah. Good. Glad you're on it. <laughs> <laughs> on it now. So Therese starts her conversation about confidence or, or our, our author starts about it in recognizing that our miserableness, our miseries, our sins, they don't um, 
put God off. They don't make him flee from us. If we are, are faithful to the scriptures, they actually draw him to ourselves. Um, St. Paul says, gladly will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul glories in his weakness, in his infirmities. And St. Therese goes on, I think we mentioned it in the, the last chapter, to say, it's like an elevator. We're in this world, the season of inventions. If I recognize my littleness and my need to be lifted up, this is like an elevator. She says, the good God would not inspire unattainable desires. I can, in spite of my littleness, aspire to sanctity. For me to become greater is impossible. I must put up with myself just as I am, with all my imperfections. But I wish to find the way to go to heaven by a very straight, short, completely new little way. We're in a century of inventions. No one, now one does not even have to take the trouble to climb the steps of a stairway. In the homes of the rich, an elevator replaces them nicely. I too would like to find an elevator to lift me up to Jesus, for I am too little to climb with the rough stairway of perfection. I love that. That's so good. I love it. And, and I, it's weird to, at yeah. the same time. It's like she's turning the gospel into a modern invention. And mm -hmm. that's strange. That's a little odd. But it works. And it's true. The line that gets me that I don't really like mm -hmm. is like, I must put up with myself just as I am with all my imperfections. Woof. I don't like that. I want Jesus to make me perfect. I don't have to deal with weakness. I don't have to deal with sin. Yeah. But how beautiful it is that it is our weakness and our sin that merits us so great a redeemer. It's like we talked about last time too. Oh, happy fault. Obviously, we don't want to go out and sin. Luther said, sin vigorously and grace will be abound all the more. Oh, for real? Yeah. <laughs> that was his thing. So, <laughs> so we don't want to, you know, be crazy. But yeah. uh, um, we do want to recognize that our weakness and our sinfulness is not the thing that keeps Jesus away from us. It's actually the thing that makes him run towards us. That's so weird. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's as beautiful and as simple as mm -hmm. what I cannot do myself, Jesus will do. But it's yeah. really, really hard to believe. And to rest in the belief also requires patience. Patience sometimes feels like a cross itself. I'm t not patient at all. I want things in the, I want really big things like right away. Like what you were saying, like, I just want to be holy now. Yeah, I don't want to have to work for Come it on, because Jesus. it makes me feel sick to my stomach that I'm as sinful as I am. And so Jesus, like, can't you just fix it and we'll all be happy and the world can benefit from it, but it just doesn't work that way. So it feels like such a cross, my own, like impatience with myself, but then with worldly circumstances yeah. also. But there is so much freedom in all of this, mm -hmm. right? So if we have that humble confidence that that elevator is an elevator, which works, <laughs> it's a real which thing. other it's really quick story, yeah. uh, John and I got to go to France last year. We went to Lisieux uh -huh. and... You've been there, so uh -huh. you know what I'm talking about. But they have this uh, elevator, like right next to the basilica. It was out of order. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, oh, so it didn't work. that one didn't work sad. for me. Yeah, but anyways, back to, back to my <laughs> point. <laughs> well, even if the elevator's out of order, Jesus <laughs> yeah. will never be out he of order. Know, yeah. yeah. And we don't have to force anything. We don't have to, yeah. I mean, we have to work for it, of course, but yeah. there's no stress in this theology because it's just Jesus himself that comes in and rescues us mm -hmm. when we little ourselves so much to be as a child with a good parent. So mm -hmm. total trust, humble confidence that they will reach the top shelf for you or that he will reach the top shelf for you. Yeah. And, you know, all the best stuff is kept on the top shelf. <laughs> That's so. true. I've never really had a problem with the top shelf, just if we're being honest, but I can, I can empathize with your situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. even smaller. Yeah. So many of the, the great saints have talked about the mountain, the seven story mountain, the mountain of perfection, the, the castle, what we must climb and how arduous the task is. And Therese is like, yeah, that's all true. Or cheat code, just ask Jesus to lift you up to the top. <laughs> it's too good to like, be true. Why did we not think that? She said, what I cannot do myself, Jesus will do. He will take me and lift me up to the summit of the mountain of perfection, to the summit of the mountain of love. Yeah, why not? Lift us up, Jesus. Um, but then the thing that naturally counters us or keeps us from believing that 
is our wretchedness, right? We all have this habit of looking at our dark side, at our ugliness, at the the worst things. And in a sense, that's necessary. We have to wrestle with our sinfulness. But when we're wrestling with our sinfulness, being in the darkness, looking towards the darkness isn't going to help, right? We have to keep our eyes fixed on the purifying sun, the light of light, which Jesus is and who changes dust into gold. Wow. How incredible that when we are with him, all of a sudden, our even our sins, even our weakness becomes an occasion to delight in his brilliance and in his mercy. Father Jean says, I'm not telling you you believe too much in your own wretchedness. Oh, this is we so are more wretched than we ever realize. But I am telling you, you do not believe enough in merciful love. Boom. Boom. You what is that? Page 29. You're wretched. You're wretched. Yeah, that's page you have 29. The book that's on page 29. You need to like exclamation mark Star all over that. that. One. Yeah. yeah. We must have confidence, not in spite of our miseries, but because of them, since it is misery which attracts mercy. Mercy is a, a beautiful and incredible word. In, in the Latin, it's misericordia. And there's a, a couple of different ways to, to explain this. So, you could translate that miseris cor dare, my heart is given to the miserable. You could translate the misericordia, so the, a heart that shares in the miseries um, of another. This is a, a beautiful and deep word, mercy. It doesn't mean just like seeing others and pitying them. Like, oh, oh, that must be so bad for you. I'm so sorry. Aww. Oh, poor thing. <laughs> oh, get over it. No, that's not mercy. Mercy sees the other suffering and jumps in. Uh, the one's heart is moved. And it's like, I'm not just going to sit here while you're suffering. I'm getting in there. And Jesus did that with this love. the entire human race, right? He's like, okay, you guys have really messed this up. I need to go down there get in this, get my hands dirty, and lift you from this misery. St. Thomas Aquinas, my friend, oh, Thomas. says to have mercy belongs to the nature of God. And it is in this that his omnipotence manifests itself in the highest degree. So think of that. God's uh, omnipotence could be shown, what, in the, in the beauty of a mountain, in the vastness of the oceans, even in the, the face of a little child. St. Thomas says no. It's most properly shown, his power, his omnipotence is most properly shown when he's showing us mercy. Again, one of those super, Christ. super simple things that are really, it's so hard to to understand. I went through a season of like, kind of like a, I think a good obsession <laughs> 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 with trying to understand mercy. Like it's so easy and beautiful and everything. And later on in this uh chapter i think it's this one he talks about how people are like refuse this doctrine of mercy Mm -hmm. because it's just too easy and too beautiful and like yeah totally like it just can't be that easy because life is so hard and i mess up so much so uh we went to a a scott hahn conference on mercy (laughs) it was like three days on mercy by the end of it i was like Okay, maybe I get it. Maybe this is real. Maybe God can uh-huh. act this way. But then later on, just by falling more in love with God, like my heart opened up. I guess really more trusting God hmm. was when confidence, maybe. Oh, uh-huh. humble confidence uh-huh. in in mercy that I started to understand it. It's like one of those things we say in church life so much. It has to go from the head to the heart. Yeah, and my heart just was so confused by this and now that experience of mercy is more personal to oh, you yeah yeah yeah. so now it's better <laughs> yeah, oh, <good. laughs> fixed it fixed it yeah this is something i wrestle with a lot so i will you know go to confession feel all forgiven and feel really great and um just be delighting in god's mercy and then the next day sin again and be like god will never forgive me mm. you know this is never you know i i've made him mad it's over. It's over. He's cutting me off. And then I get up the confidence to go to confession again and remember like, oh, I can run to my father and he will forgive me. I guess I should do that. Mm-hmm. And then the whole cycle starts over again. So yeah. he proves his mercy for us over and over and over again. And lest anyone think they're too far gone, lest anyone think like, oh, I am beyond God's mercy, St. Therese addresses this. Mm-hmm. She says, <clears throat> 
You are my truly son. Oh no! <laughs> no okay. <laughs> oh, wait, can you do one sentence? No. Do one sentence no. like that, please. Take when I interrupt you. You may truly say that if I had committed all possible crimes, okay, this is Therese saying. You may truly say that if I had committed all possible crimes, I would still have the same confidence. I would feel that this multitude of offenses would be like a drop of water thrown into a flaming furnace. Ugh. Yeah. So good. All sins, all <laughs> crimes, right? All of that would be like a drop of water in the furnace of God's love. Boom. When I read this, I thought about all the sins on my heart that I had to that or that I hadn't taken to confession, and then I imagined them all as one drop of water. Then I thought of all of the worst sins I've committed in my whole life, and I put them all into that one drop of water, and then saw that drop filled with all of my nastiness slowly dropping into a flame. And as soon as it hit the fires, completely gone, totally consumed, just doesn't even, yes, thank That's you. That's the sound it makes, right? <laughs> it was, well, it, it was a little bit of an explosion. Oh. Like, because think of it. So meditation, Ignatian meditation <laughs> challenge, uh -huh, uh -huh. imagination, yeah. close your eyes and like think of all your sins as that drop of water and hitting it. It's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, that can be the like bonus. bonus I think yeah, sizzle. everybody should like think of all their sins right now and then say it with me. <laughs> Wait. <Gone. laughs> You're, I think the because explosion it's, makes it seems like the, it's a bigger deal than it is. Where it's it just is like a it's, huge deal. Okay, because in my heart it's a big deal. You see it as they're all like giant and gone, irrefu like you know, unforgivable. That is not true. But Jesus sees that it is as not true. Done. He sees it as not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I like that. I, mean, I see what he you're recognizes saying. That I see it as an, a celebration. Okay, okay, maybe so we should like not fireworks. talk about this anymore. But it's like a little drop of water. <laughs> There's like lots of little pieces <laughs> coming out from it. Have you ever seen it's water like go into a furnace? Celebration. It goes... It, it's more like a cartoon in my head. <laughs> okay. Moving on. This affirmation is logical <laughs> and irrefutable. <laughs> the water just goes away in a furnace. Yeah. Trez was marvelously confident, but... If you know the life of St. Therese, it's like she didn't really sin, right? She, she, it was said by her spiritual director that from the age of three years, she never refused God anything. Well, yeah, yeah. if we could say <laughs> that, then, oh, I'd have so much confidence. It would be easy. But, but she yeah. responds to that very objection. Yeah. What did she say? Well, first she says the whole furnace thing, right? Mm -hmm. But then she says... I feel that if, though this would be impossible, you were to find a soul more weak and little than mine, you would be pleased to shower upon it even greater favors if it abandoned itself to you with complete confidence in your infinite mercy. Like, why don't we just trust that? Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. If I could just trust that. That Therese thinks, first and foremost, the thing we need to emulate is that well, Therese yeah. thinks that she has the smallest, weakest soul in human history. That's, she's just probably a little bit mistaken there. So mistaken. Um, but if we can have that same humility, then that'll inspire that incredible confidence. And we won't have that excuse of like, oh, Therese Which was holy and I'm not. Which is what made Therese. Like Therese is that way because right. that's what she did. She did humble confidence. Yes. Right? Yes. So she that's how it works. So like, how does this work? Right? That's how it works. Okay. Yeah. So just be like Therese. <laughs> Humility. But wait, Humility. she's a perfect saint. Confidence. Ugh. But she says, if you could find a soul, even if Stephanie Sov Stovall's soul, even if Father Alex's soul were somehow less than mine, I think you would want to delight with that soul even more. <sighs> okay. So we delight in our lowliness and our littleness. Yeah. Okay. All the little souls, she wants to follow her. Your little soul, my little soul. And when we're tempted to discouragement, she says, nope. Discouragement, even then, is just another opportunity. Nippa. 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 It's another opportunity <laughs> to trust in merciful love. The merciful love that it's especially for the miserable. So if you don't believe Therese, next he talks, he quotes the Bible. Right? So that's pretty solid. Jesus' own words, right? So he goes through some examples of this theology of Christ being attracted to the miserable and saving us from our misery in the Holy Scriptures. So first, he talks about prodigal son, right? Who's that? 
You know the prodigal son. It's a story that we have told in the church over and over and over again in beautiful times and beautiful ways. The prodigal son. Is. The prodigal son. The son. Yeah. That said, I don't need my father. I got it. It's all... On From the fifteenth chapter of the Gospel to of Luke. have the best life possible, yeah. he says, that I "Father, I wish myself. you were dead. <gasps> I want my inheritance. I want my half of everything that's yours, and I'm out of here. I'm so leaving." Rude. Right, and then he does, and it says his inheritance was swallowed up with women mm. and drink mm. and all the life of the profligate. Vegas, yeah, Vegas, baby. And so he gets, he, he finally has to take a job slopping some pigs and he longs to eat what the pigs are eating. Mm. This and, kid that had so much. Yeah. And remembers nobody's treated, even a hired person isn't treated like this in my father's house. I will get up and go to my father. And even while he's a long way away, the father sees him and rejoices and prepares for him. And runs to him and embraces him and says, get a robe, put a ring on his finger. Uh, my son was dead, but now is alive, right? So it's a, no father, no natural or earthly father would do this, right? This is a ridiculous story from a, a human perspective. I wish you were dead. I'm going to go and spend all of your money. And then when I feel like it, I'm just going to come back and ask for forgiveness. And you're just going to forgive me and it's going to be okay. Yeah, that's nuts. Would your dad do that? I mean, I hope so. Oh, okay. Good. You, <laughs> I hope my dad would too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I was on my retreat that I'd mentioned before in some other episodes, mm -hmm. uh, I sat was sitting with a woman at lunch. This was before the silent part of our retreat oh, started, sure. but I was already ready to go into my silence. And then uh -huh. she comes over. And she's like, "Is anyone sitting here?" And I'm like, "No, you can sit there, but please just don't talk to me." You know. <laughs> she sits yes. down, and then she just talks for so long and it was a beautiful conversation but one of the things that she was there for was to find healing from she had like 11 kids and a lot of them had left the faith and her very oldest um stopped talking to her four years ago and she says i'll send her birthday cards and i never hear back and oh this poor lady she's just heartbroken by this but in everything that she was saying the longing in her heart for her daughter was so real. And it mm. just took me to the story right away. Mm -hmm. It's like, you you would not hold this against her. Like, she just wanted her daughter back. Yeah. Even just a phone call. So, yeah. So there are examples in real life of someone mm -hmm. loving in this way. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet a lot of people have that longing in their heart for their kids their kid. that have gone away. And, oh, yeah. You know? I've, I've experienced a lot of families who just long for their kid to come back and be well. Woof. Woof. So that's the father in the in the story. And the kid says, I will rise and go to my father. That's the confidence we need to approach the father with. Um, fa and he practices it as he's going. Like, I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And before you, I am not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Right? So he's practicing what he's going to say in his head. He's getting ready to, to encounter the father. Um, but you remember how the father received him. Not as a servant, but as a beloved son. He runs out. He sees him with compassion. He throws himself on his neck. He presses him to his heart. He embraces him and he tells his servants, bring forth quickly the first robe and put it on him and a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and make merry. There's dancing and music. So that's my favorite part. My favorite line, maybe this whole entire book yeah. on page 35, we do not dance enough in the spiritual <laughs> life. <laughs> uh -huh. It's like the falls. We let them demolish us yeah. and the joys we hide from maybe in fear of falling into pride. I don't know. But we should dance. Yeah. Yeah. His advice to us is so good. After absolution, you should dance like the prodigal son did at the request and for the joy of his father. We do not dance enough. Yeah, I, I agree with that totally. You I think we to should dance. sing and dance. And the problem is every time I dance, so the smartphones come out and then you've got viral <laughs> videos of priests dancing on the internet and that's just not a good look for anybody. So. Maybe we'll get people to listen to this <laughs> podcast. <right now. laughs> I'm not that kind of dancer. <laughs> no. It's very awkward. It's very oh, no. awkward. I love how he immediately turns and tells parents like, this needs to be you. 
Yeah. Yeah. He said, parents, educators, give the children confided to your care an understanding of this divine mercy by believing in it and practicing it yourselves. Where will kids learn this? um, What is it? The kind of love? Merciful love. Merciful love. (laughs) Uh, Un... How come we can't think of of the word unconditional unconditional love parents have to teach unconditional love. Um, He says it is this faith which will prevent them from falling again. And if they fall, they will rise again. They will come back because you will have acquainted them with the gentleness of God. They will say, I know how good God is. I know how to abide in his mercy from the depths of my sin. I shall rise up and go to my father. So often parents ask me, Father, what can I do to keep my kids Catholic? What can I do um, to teach them and, and keep them in the faith? Well, I think this is one of the most important things is to teach Love. them mercy. Oof. Um, a lot of times people who will come back to the faith, who, who want to come back to the faith after many years are like, what must I do to come back? I'm sure there's so many things like, is there paperwork? Do I have to, <laughs> what is all the stuff that I need to do to come back? And, and the answer is come back. Confession. Get up and go to the Father. Now, to reintroduce yourself to the full <laughs> life of the church, you have to go to confession. Yes, to encounter but Jesus in confession. And that's mercy at its finest right there in is, the confessional. That is where the prodigal father, the father of the prodigal son likes to hang out, right there in the confessional, mm. waiting for his children to run back to him. So parents, if you want your kids to stay Catholic, show them. them without weakness or compromise, but in goodness, that God is good. And tr- make sure they feel very comfortable saying, I shall rise up and go to my father. I shall rise up and go to my mother. And through them, I shall go to my father in heaven. How many young people have lost the faith, not from having fallen, but from having been not been helped when they were in a time of trial or difficulty? Which doesn't mean don't discipline. Like that's, because this is like a great thought. Sure. And it is sure. <laughs> like at the end of the day, <laughs> this is the goal from the person who actually has children. <laughs> yes, but like with prodigal son story, I'm like, okay, but then you still have to sit down and have a talk with them, you know. So there's finding that I know you're you wouldn't you after you the dancing, would be like yes, after the dancing, like uh-huh. maybe the next morning, you know, uh-huh. at the end of breakfast or something. Be like, okay, but can we have a serious conversation about? So how he, what you did was wrong. He did have stuff. a serious conversation with the older son in the story. Stop being jealous. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. Older son. Yeah. 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 So next, he goes from prodigal son. Our author goes from prodigal son straight to... Um, this was mind-blowing for me. He goes straight to the good thief. The good thief. St. Dismas. This say. is really powerful. Yeah. Um, and he says, just as the prodigal son recognized his guilt... The good thief recognizes his guilt, looks into the eyes of Jesus and says, some of the most beautiful words in scripture, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Boom. And then how does Jesus respond? Amen. I say to you, this day you shall be with me in paradise. What? That's so crazy. So I love how on page 36, the author uh, says, what does he say? Oh, he calls him the first canonized saint Mm -hmm. by Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. I've never thought of that before. No, me neither. Yeah. That is so good. So much in that. Like, if you're ever having a really hard time with a really bad sin, go to the the Adoration Chapel and just, like, meditate on that. Yeah. The good thief. And how... Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's exactly what is happening. And Jesus calls him the first canonized yeah. saint. Different saints and different authors throughout history have said, like, this good thief stole heaven, right? So if you're going to steal, mm. if you're going to whatever, steal Jesus' heart, steal heaven, mm. steal um, this sort of confidence. And, and we meditate a lot. I don't know, maybe you, I think we do. We meditate a <laughs> lot, um, on, especially around Lenten stuff, on the cross mm-hmm. and putting ourselves at the foot of the cross. I don't think I meditate enough on this interaction. Same. That, because um, he, he speaks of it, the confident look you gave me, this meeting of our eyes in my mercy and in your faith has purified you in an instant and rendered us inseparable. Uh. Boom. And that purification that happened right there in that moment makes him fit for heaven a thief it's insane a okay thief. side note if yes. you haven't bought this book buy this book it is just like jim had with 
such beautiful language like this. It's true. It's true. It's true. Ten bucks parish office and I can buy it online, but you still have to come by the office to pick it up. Yeah. Next. So after the good thief, um, and and he says we need to be like the, the good thief, on the condition that you have the humility of the good thief and have his confidence and his desire for heaven, you can be the good his thief. His confidence, there Boom. it is. Yeah. The next uh, example he goes to is the Canaanite woman. You remember the Canaanite woman? No. Um, the Canaanite woman, sometimes called so the Syrophoenician women. woman. Um, pagan, foreigner, not Jewish, and her daughter has a demon. Mm-hmm. And she really wants Jesus to take care of her daughter and to, to cure her daughter and to get rid of this demon. Um, and Jesus, so she's chasing after him and the apostles are like, hey, can't you shut that woman up? So rude. <laughs> But she keeps persisting, she keeps persisting, and then Jesus stops and says, okay, fine, what do you want? Um, And she tells him, and uh, he responds, well, I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. Sorry, stand in line. And this is where she has that beautiful line that, that is so powerful. Even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the master's table, right? Whoa, whoa, like what confidence, what faith, what humble confidence. First, Jesus calls her a dog. <laughs> and rather than being like, well, technically the word, snorted. technically the word in Greek is puppy. Oh, yeah. He calls her a puppy. Oh, yeah. I'd much rather be called a puppy than a dog. Little puppy, but still offensive. Okay. Right. So she could have been a Karen and been like, excuse me, can I speak to your manager? Can I speak to your father in heaven? <laughs> But she was in humility. She doubled down on it. She was like, okay. But Fine. even the dogs Ugh. eat the scraps from the master's table. The and Jesus crumbs. knew what he was doing, right? He, he did all of this to elicit her response in faith and to show that even a scrap, even a crumb, even a little particle. The crumbs. Right. Is enough to destroy all evil and all sin and everything. But he didn't give just a, a scrap or a particle or a crumb. He poured out all of his blood for the Canaanite woman, for you, for me, for the Edmundite woman. <laughs> Not um, her. Yes, even the Edmundite woman. <laughs> <laughs> and it just doesn't seem fair. Like thinking of prodigal son and the good thief and all this, you know. This woman that's not even a Jew. Yeah. And he's just like, yep, I'm going to love you just as much. And I'm going to give everything to you. The same as my apostles that have been following me. Because of her persistence and because of her faith, even more. That's just not fair. We're working so hard. Well, what set her in the so next dedicated. category? I'm talking as an apostle, right? Yeah. Like I'm one of the, I guess Mary Magdalene makes more sense since I'm a girl. Yeah. I'm a girl. And I've been working so hard. I left behind everything. And I'm like, wait, what? She gets just as much as I get? I can barely walk and look at all the Mm -hmm, cuts mm -hmm. on my foot from my sandals Mm -hmm. and following you all the time. You're going to give her the same? Too much pride, too much jealousy. Get out of here with that. Okay. Get out of here with that. But it's true. Those feelings are real. That's why the brother was in the story. Exactly. So then the other side of it is like what you said. Yeah. Yeah can't get into all of that she's in the next category because of her humility and her confidence humility which is, humble confidence <laughs> I love this chapter, i'm telling I you this chapter is everything such a great <laughs> chapter so then from the canaanite woman to the centurion you remember that his words are famous throughout history because they're included in the mass lord i am not worthy that you should enter under my roof but only speak a word and my servant shall be healed he has a line here that i think is so cool um, that throughout all of heaven, throughout the eternity of the centurion's time in heaven, every time mass is said, he must just light up with joy. I never thought about that it was either. His words, yeah, no. Oh, that's so fun to think Super about. Super cool. It's so cute to think about, like picturing the centurion yeah. up there every mass, and there's masses happening all the time. So then I get into. I mean, he's just constantly <laughs> happy. Like, Jumping up and down. Overjoyed every single time. He dances enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the way he phrases it too, though, Jesus was delighted in the centurion's word. And Jesus picked them to be in the liturgy as our preparation for Holy Communion. Boom. Wow. That goes back to our thing from last. Do you believe that Jesus delights in you? 
Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that you are a joy? Do you think you've ever said something that Jesus was like, hmm, that's pretty good? That could be in a mass, maybe. Like, hmm. Whoa. Yeah. Why did the Saturian get such a treatment? Why did he say something so profound? Can I guess? Go ahead. Humble confidence. Humble confidence. Right? He recognized his own unworthiness. He recognized Jesus' power and he believed. When Jesus tests our faith, we need, like the Canaanite woman, like the centurion, responses that eternal wisdom inspires in the little ones. And then he too is filled with admiration for us and showers his graces upon us. Whoa. Whoa. Damn. The Bible's so cool. And then he goes on. There's, But wait, there's more. He talks about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You remember them? No. Right? Well, they were BFFs, BFFs. of Jesus. He liked to hang at their crib. Um, and Bethany. Some scholars think that Bethany was like the, the Nichols Hills of the ancient <laughs> world, like the Oklahoma City equivalent, right? Would be. The well, then I don't like that. So then Jesus money. decides to hang out with the rich people? Well, he, so no. Jesus loves everybody. He just, we just talked about this Canaanite Syrophoenician woman who was like rejected by society. But you know what? Jesus loves rich people too. Sorry. Because they loved him so much. Right. Yes. And not because of this, but they did bankroll a lot of his public ministry. You know, he's walking around with 12 dudes yeah. all over the place. 12 dudes got to eat. Yeah. I've watched The Chosen, I know. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, just an aside. You don't have to, whatever. But he goes and, and chills at their house because it's comfy and they're friends and, and they love each other. But then Lazarus dies. And so Mary and Martha send word to Jesus. And it says Jesus waits three days before he returns. That's so mean. And his apostles are like, that's Jesus, so mean. What are you doing? It's your best friend. All right. And he's like, come on, let's go. Let's go wake Lazarus is what he says. So then they journey back. And um, so Mary meets him outside the city and it was like, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus is like, don't you believe in the resurrection? He's like, I, I have come to believe, Lord, in the resurrection of the dead. That's why I knew that you were going to do it. Mm-hmm. But then you didn't. And he's dead. And what the heck are you going to do? And uh, Jesus says, believe in me. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. And then Martha comes out and is like, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What the heck? And um, <laughs> Jesus is like, open the tomb. And Martha's like, but Lord, he stinketh. It's been three days. He there stinketh. will be a stench. That's a pretty fun uh, line in the, the older versions. <laughs> but Lord, <laughs> really... he stinketh. <laughs> yeah. In like the Dewey Rames version and whatnot. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> There will be a stench is how we translate it That's now, not as which fun. is not as cool. Boring. <laughs> and uh, Jesus, this is this is your moment. <gasps> Jesus wept. Right. The shortest verse in the, the Bible he saw that with sadness and he prayed and he said, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus comes out. So creepy. Yeah. Tied and bound. And Jesus says, untie him. And boom, shows he has power over even power over even death. So yet another We skipped over to like page 49 for this, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's like Bible story, Bible story, Bible story, Bible story, Bible story. Bible story, Bible story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we're on page 49. And Padre de Jean says, Père Jean, Père Jean. Père Jean. Don French. Jean. Père Jean says, to reward Ma- Martha and Mary for the tenderness of their confidence, he permitted Lazarus to die, Oof. giving them the chance to demonstra- demonstrate a confidence a thousand times greater by an act of faith in his omnipotence. Jesus brought Lazarus back to life, but before he did so, he required, as always, an act of faith. I feel like this is... A very important moment right now, (laughs) because how many times have I asked for something? Yep. And he doesn't give it. Yep. Over and over and over again. Um, It also reminds me of St. Monica whenever St. Augustine was leaving. Does does he talk about this in this book? Is that where I got this? Sorry, spoiler alert, if so. So St. Monica... You know, the mother of St. Augustine, one Mm -hmm. of the greatest saints of all times, doctor of the church, all of that. Uh, St. Augustine is crazy man. Great sinner. 
great sinner. And he's decided that he's going to go away. I think, let's just say that this is when he's going to go to Rome. No. Yeah, I think Rome. it is in this book because I've, I is remember it? hearing it recently. Okay, sorry. No, that's okay. Keep going. But it fits. Yes. <laughs> and her prayer is, Jesus, don't let him go. Don't let him go. Don't let him go. Don't let him go. I need him to stay. If he leaves, then it's all going to just blow up and he's never going to be saved. Yeah. But what ends up happening is God gives the yes for him to take the trip. He takes the trip and he goes. And um, that's when he meets St. Ambrose, which then gives him his huge conversion through their friendship. So even though it was an apparent no to her, I mean, it was a no to her request because he to her first to prayer. her first prayer well to her second prayer because her first prayer was his conversion her second prayer was yeah. don't let him go right. so ultimately it was a yes to he didn't answer that second prayer yeah. yes but it was a yes like you said to elicit the humble confidence uh-huh right yeah okay mm-hmm. Lord. to grow all looks grow lost. In faith i don't know how you're gonna fix this but fix it but fix mm-hmm. it and she still even though it was a no um she she didn't give up on her faith. Mm-hmm. She kept going and trusted that it was all going to be okay and kept praying. And he gave us one of the greatest saints ever. So mm-hmm. that's why... One of the most beautiful stories of conversion ever. Read the confessions. Mm-hmm. This is my confession. This is my confession. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I just want to be like, hey, is this... Are you listening, everybody? Everybody? Because... There's going to be so many unanswered prayers. Garth Brooks, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Please tell me you know what I'm... Are you kidding me? I would have started singing it. I'm sorry. You sing it. Unanswered prayer. I can't think of it now. Oh, shoot. How does it go? Thank God for unanswered prayer. Oh, my gosh. It's like... I love Garth Brooks. We're wasting people's time. (laughs) We're going to cut this part out. No, we're not. This is good. They're yelling at us because how can we not know about this right now? For unanswered prayers. I don't know. I'm just seeing him and his okay ex-girlfriend and his wife. Anyways. So sometimes we don't get the sometimes answered prayer right Brooks. away. But it's because God has he might plans be for holding Brooks. back um, to give us the greater yes, to lift us up even higher. So even Garth Brooks knows how this whole theology thing works, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, sometimes the unanswered <laughs> prayers make the way for the, the even bigger gifts that God wants to give us. To make us great saints. Thanks, Garth. So back to continuing with our, our the biblical examples that he gives. He talks about Jesus asleep in the boat, right? He's asleep and the apostles are like, it's storming, Jesus, come on. And... Jesus, when, when the apostles shake him awake, he's like, guys, come on. I was napping. Men of little faith. Why is it that you don't trust? Why is there this lack of confidence? Yeah, it's so good. So he says, men of little faith, not men of no character, men without energy, men without discipline. No, he says men of little faith. Mm. It is truly such doubt that pains and offends him most. Mm -hmm. So when bad things happen, we lose our minds. We lose our peace and start trying to fix everything on our own, make a huge mess of everything. Or we, we begin to attempt to control the situation. Instead, we should say, Jesus, you take care of it. Jesus, I trust in you. Or Jesus, Jesus, like I surrender to you. Take care of everything. Jesus, I surrender to you. Take care of everything. And I would like you to get up and calm the winds right now. But if you just want to keep napping, I'll come lay next to you. I don't care. In the storm. Yeah. In the midst of the storm. Mm -hmm. Or like St. Peter, when he calls him out on the water and he starts to sink. Lord, we're perishing. Like, oh, Jesus grabs him and lifts him up. Those storms that come up against us in our soul. Like if we fix our eyes on Jesus, if we have humble confidence and trust in him, we can do miracles, but we don't have this confidence. We don't have this trust. Well, like Peter, we look away yeah. and then that's when we fall into the water. Therese had this trust. Therese, not because of like all the incredible and wonderful things that she did, because she was a cloistered nun. She didn't do a lot of stuff, you know, in the eyes of the world, but because of her incredible confidence, boom, people saw in her the power of God. 
Two months before her death, someone said to her, you're a saint. And she answered, pointing to the tops of the trees in the garden, golden in the setting sun. My soul appears to you to be all brilliant and golden because it is exposed to the rays of love. If the divine sun stopped sending me his fire, I would immediately become dark and full of shadows. That can be our soul. Enlightened by God's love. We don't have to do special fancy things. We just have to turn ourselves like a sunflower Mm -hmm. to the sun. To the sun. Say, Jesus, I come to you completely beautiful. Beautiful like the sun which you are. Pure with your own purity. Beautiful with your own beauty. Rich with your own treasures. This is the plentiful redemption that Jesus speaks of. Mm. And then when he encounters people who are sick, every time he says, "Do do you believe that I can heal you? We have to be the ones who say, yeah. I believe it, Jesus. And not only I believe it, I believe that you want to do it. I believe that I'm going to thank you already for in the future having done it. What confidence. Yeah, okay, but then we know also that he doesn't do it. He doesn't heal every person. Yeah, Yeah. it's their childhood leukemia. Yeah. But we have to have the same confidence that, as St. Augustine says, the Lord only allows evil when he's going to bring about a greater good. And... As St. Francis de Sales says, to have a holy indifference, to prefer prefer neither health nor sickness, to prefer neither life nor death, to prefer neither riches nor poverty, but to prefer only, first and foremost, God's will. That's what keeps me from that confidence is because I'm like, Mm -hmm. well, what if he doesn't answer me and then I'm going to be really disappointed? What if I don't have the courage to prefer poverty or sickness? Yeah. Or what if I'm not going to be okay with the no? Yeah. So we all have this innate need, though, for that. Like every person, I have a need to be happy. I have a need to live on love. I have a need to be festive. I have a need to sing. Um, I know all of that. Psychiatrists and uh, mental health professionals attribute most of the mental health problems common today to guilt, right? And we have this sense of guilt. And the remedy is from them and from unbelievers is to say sin doesn't exist, to suppress the notion of sin, to remove from man the sense of sin. And we see that so rampant in our culture. Like, what Mm -hmm. is sin? Everything's permitted. As long as you don't hurt someone, you could do whatever you want. But it doesn't work. The conscience is still deep within all of us. We may succeed in partially or temporarily stifling it, but we cannot kill our conscience any more than we can kill God. But the remedy, the real remedy, we see, you know, even now, when we have so worked to, to take sin out of our culture, mental health and even suicide is higher than ever. The real remedy that will bring peace, the peace which Jesus gives, is what St. John said. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. So you know that phrase Catholic guilt? Yes. I really hate it. I yeah. hate it when people say that because it's not that because we have to go to confession that our sins are on our mind all the time. And so then that produces this Catholic guilt. We're all Father John Ricardo on Catholic Radio. I love it. He talked mm-hmm. about how uh, we all go to confession, whether we realize it or not. Some of us go to a bartender or to a hairdresser or to your best friend. <laughs> yes. But we all end up going to confession because the nature of our humanity is that we do have the things that we have done wrong on our heart and they do weigh heavily on us. And so it's not Catholic guilt that we have. It's that the Catholics have the remedy for guilt guilt. in confession. Yes. So we can deal with the guilt in a beautiful way. If anybody says Catholic guilt ever again, you just let them know. And, and you, we, we do have to have that heart to heart conversation. Like you're saying, like it's a very human thing to need to get it off of our chest. And confession is the divine tribunal where absolution is given by Jesus himself. And you can hear those words of absolution and Which find Which is so that powerful. Peace. Hearing those words is just And Jesus designed huge. it this way. Why? Because he too has, t- has taken on our human nature as a human heart. God has made himself man. He has brought himself down to our level and he has raised us up through sanctifying grace um, to those heights. So good. Yeah. So prayer challenge for conference two, imagine you're in a boat with Jesus. Mm. He's asleep and mm. the storm is raging. What, it, the, sorry, what is the storm in your life right now that he has not calmed? Ask him to do that which you cannot do. 
Ask him to give you his peace in the situation and childlike trust that in its fullness of time, Jesus will calm the storm. So as always, it's great to go to adoration to uh, pray, talk with him about the hard things, but don't forget, you can do this anywhere. Anywhere. Anytime. Anywhere. Yeah. So bring that, bring that to him today. Yeah. And then really look at in that exercise, where's that humble confidence? Where can I grow in humility? Where can I grow in trust? Beautiful. And then follow the exhortation of St. Paul. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your modesty be known to all men. The Lord is nigh in everything. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it, As it was, was in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever and shall be, world without, without end. end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.